Hello and welcome to Shape the System, where we find and tell the stories that help people to rethink the way the world works. We interview people from all over the world who are helping to change our systems for the better. Shape the System is an independent podcast with support from KPMG High Growth Ventures, who help ambitious founders and their teams scale up for success. More about KPMG High Growth Ventures after the interview. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Another episode of Shape the System. And unbelievably, for three years that we've been running the show, we haven't actually spoken to anyone with any kind of real your relationship to anything blockchain related. And today we're going to broach that topic, which I'm, we're joined by Max and Max has just given me the most amazing facial expression of how have you not spoken to anyone about blockchain? <laughs> but the context here is really interesting for me. We're talking about blockchain and a whole bunch of related technologies with Max from Winding Tree in the context of the travel industry. And I know that seems like an unusual place to start, but Max, why don't we start with just a little bit of an introduction about yourself, but more specifically, I'm, I'm interested to understand kind of the nature of the travel industry today before we then dive into a bit about Winding Tree's doing. All right, let's do it. I'm really, really surprised that I did note you didn't tell me that (laughs) I am really the first person to talk about blockchain on your pod. So I'm Max, Maxim or whatever, have many names. And well, who am I? I'm a software engineer. I taught myself how to code, I don't know, way back when, 20 plus years ago. I don't know, my life sort of was revolving around computers, surprisingly so for my environment, I guess, and I'm not going to go there. Yeah, so I've been working as as a coder for many, many years, and uh, I love traveling, and I hate to travel, actually. I hate the process of getting settled, and also by some coincidence, a few years back, I started working with uh, hotels and stuff like that and sort of learning about the space and seeing many, many opportunities for like, to me, the space and sort of, I don't know, out, out of date, not, not in touch sort of with modern tech. Right. And so, so I, I started working in a few different projects and in 2014, with my company, we went through Y Combinator in, in Silicon Valley. It was in the hotel space or actually on the intersection, that company of uh, hospitality and, and airline industry. Uh-huh. And it, that, like that's when really for the first time I started digging into the, you know, the nitty gritty of what travel is, how, how travel industry works and stuff. And tremendous, tremendous amount of learning that I've done over the course of, I don't know, let's say a couple of years after that, between two, 14 to 16. Uh-huh. And um, during that time, so I was in Silicon Valley and I started organizing a meetup for travel startups. And later, you know, we had a couple of conferences that we did. And uh, through that, through talking to many, many people, again, from startups, from the travel industry, we sort of came to a realization that one of the sources of all sorts of problems in the travel industry is the fact that it's heavily, heavily centralized. You know, there are only a few companies that I'm going to say control everything, right? Right. Or serve and, everything. You know, my, yeah. 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 My, my numbers are not up to date, but yeah, back in the day, it's, I, I don't know. I don't think they've changed a lot, but a tidbit, uh, a, a number, I guess one number is that more than 50, 60% of leisure travel in the United States uh, in terms of hospitality is goes via Priceline or Expedia, you know, one of the two companies, right. you know, two, two of those companies control more than half of the market. And are they owned by the same company, uh, by the way? They're owned by separate companies, I think, as well. So so those are two separate companies. And, and again, uh, they're, they're, uh, they use all sorts of tricks, I guess, here that, you know, we have an illusion of choice. It's like, it's like sneakers and Mars, right? Like you, you're thinking that, that you, you're like, okay, today I'm going to buy the other one, right? Because, <laughs> you know, diversity, but it's the same company. Right? right. Right. And so, yeah, yeah. We think that, Hey, there's hotels.com, there's kayak, there's orbits, there's this, but it's one or the other. Always, uh-huh. always, inevitably. And of course, there is a new player on, on the market. It's a Chinese company that was originally called Citrip. Now it's called Trip. So it's not a duopoly. Maybe it's a triopoly these days. 
But the fact of life is, you know, there is a very, very limited number of companies that all of those hotel bookings and go I, through. I want to I come up onto that for a second because I think I want to kind of understand this this value chain because I think this part of this is the ordering part. And I actually had firsthand experience with this recently. I had a not a great experience with one of the brands here. I don't need to throw them under the bus, but one of the two you just mentioned, mm-hmm. ironically. Well, yeah. coincidentally, probably, not ironically. And when I went into digging on it, I realized that they were under a parent company that owned about six or seven of these brands. And that sort of helped me to understand, okay, on the booking side, there's certainly a massive amount of centralization and a lot of people thinking they're going through a particular provider, but they're actually all going through one. But my understanding is there's more than that. I think if you're going further down the value chain into how flights get booked, for example, you have a similar situation. You have Amadeus and Galileo that own that are the two main booking platforms that all of the airlines lo- use that are also completely centralized. And that could take Airbnb even as another example for that type of booking. There's literally they're the, a dominant player that probably has 60, 70% of the homestay type market in any given kind of Western or even non-Western market, I'm guessing. What are the other parts of the value chain that I'm forgetting here in terms of front-end booking, back-end fulfillment, r- hotels? Like what, what else is there in there? You know, I think you mentioned all the all the usual suspects. You're absolutely right. On the airline booking side, there's Amadeus, Sabre, and uh, Galileo. Oh, I'm forgetting the other one. That you know, it's, Galileo is one of the products of those two companies. <laughs> there is uh, one smaller GDS or, or, or global distribution system, and, and actually those global distribution systems, that is Amadeus and Sabre, they're big players in the ho- hotel space as well. And for like small kind of tour agencies or or travel agencies, they're connected to those GDS systems. And again, because of the situation, because there are very few players on the market, you, you would think, and I certainly as a software engineer, you know, starting to work, and that was in 2014, uh. right? Starting to work with the systems, with with the technology that those companies are providing. I was absolutely like I was blindsided. I didn't expect that it would be so shitty. You know, I thought I really didn't. You know, I thought, hey, this is 2014 or whatever the year was, and and I thought, I mean, I'm used to the fact that okay, as a software engineer, you want to create some new product. Okay, you take one API from here, another API from here. You take the I don't know some sort of library to build the front end and back end and whatnot. You put thing this thing together in a couple of weeks and and you just release it. Uh, no, no way. And <laughs> it was like the process. There's a lot of parallels uh-huh. here, I think, because I mean I think about my exposure to financial services. You know, you have something like the Swift Network globally or the ACH Network in the US, and this is thirty to forty year old infrastructure. This is infrastructure that got built in the seventies or eighties. And we're kind of still running on these backbones. Is this kind of the parallel issue that we're seeing in travel, which is there's just some large archaic kind of legacy systems and that's kind of what everyone's baked into. And the switching costs yep. are high, but also the kind of the incumbents just really don't have any interest in trying to to move away from this. Is that part of what's happening here? Why would they? Oh, absolutely. Why would they? Uh, I mean, they're sitting on a, you know, it's a gold mine. Right. And uh, and yeah, the joke is well, it's not it's not a joke. It's it's the sad reality that it like those systems run on mainframes right. that the software for those were was written in the sixties, right? right? And of course, they have no interest to upgrade that. Yeah, I, w- the thing that I've, I want to try to make the, the the thing that's changed since then. This is kind of what I'm trying to do is to understand that might have been right for the world as it was in the eighties. And I think about the level of like there's a graph that you can look at and it. Can, you can plot it with pretty much any major city or any major airport and it's the amount of people going through that city or that airport who are tourists every year and it's th- classically only up and to the right. I mean, as a species, we're, yeah. you know, literally have never travelled as much as we have now. And so if, if yeah. the world gets smaller, it feels like this infrastructure is not built for how the world operates today because of how small the world's got with, you know, the access to travel and huge growing middle class in a lot of developing economies as well as Western economies, you know, improvements in travel in terms of airlines and the, and the like. What I'm trying to understand is well, who gets left behind in all this? Because if you've got a whole bunch of people who are now traveling more than ever and they can go to places more than ever, like what is the disconnect between all of that travel and all that economic opportunity and the people who live and are trying to operate tourism-related businesses in 
those places where people are traveling, whether it's Western civilized, you know, Western developing countries or, or, or otherwise? Yeah, yeah. This is a really good question. Well, well I think two categories of, of, I guess, of people, travelers. I mean, that's why, why I'm saying, you know, that I hate to travel because, you know, if things are going okay, then it's okay, I guess, right? <laughs> but one small thing, small thing goes wrong and like it's a house of cards, like everything is falling apart. Sure. Like you miss one connection and it's like, oh, it's it's a nightmare. And then then your bags are flying completely in the opposite direction somewhere, you know? And uh, travelers are, are left behind and, you know, we've thought, you know, long and hard about how what what we're trying to do is, is we'll be able to help traveler to just feel better along the way, right? And, but I think a very important category here is 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 the local communities. It's it's the businesses that that suffer at the end of the day because I mean, very simply, you know, you go on Booking dot com today, and in, in some cases, and maybe they've changed it or they keep changing it all the time. Right next to the book button, they say, "Hey." As a traveler, you pay no commission whatsoever, right. right? Little do you know that at the end of the day, the hotel has to pay, you know, on average, 18% commission. 18 is sort of a standard rate. Right. They just, like, you're a fool believing that you don't pay that. Of course you pay that commission. Right. Uh, who else is paying for everything? But yeah, at the end of the day, you know, the hotel receiving all that money. Again, you think that, okay, you paid $100 for your Cheap hotel, right? Relatively cheap, a hundred bucks, <laughs> uh, depending where you go. Sydney, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, so, no, Sydney, by the way. You know, to, so th- that's that's the case. Actually, I'm trying to um, make today is that I go to in the beginning of this year. I was in in Georgia, country, not the state. Mm-hmm. Beautiful, beautiful country. I'm. I mean, I don't want to say it's the third world, but like it, it definitely. It feels rustic. It feels rural. Right. right? Sure. It, it, that makes it interesting, of course. So okay. that's why I want to go there. Right. But but you go to one of those destinations and uh, like those people in, in those places, they have no recycling. They have no like basic, like they put their trash into the ground, right? right. Where they live, right? Like they just dig a ditch and they just put it there. Mm-hmm. Is it sustainable? No. And, and they're paying. So... What this little community that where where it was this little mountain resort right at hotel room by the way there eleven dollars thirty bucks thirty bucks <laughs> thirty bucks it's, uh, I mean whatever right but again those people they then have to send the tithe to Booking dot com right. it's about twenty percent right and which is uh, and again you see how they live it's very rustic it's very rural. But they they are lacking basic infrastructure, right? right? That it's a beautiful place. And I mean, like as a traveler, as a person who goes there, you would want to preserve it for as long as possible. Also, it's the only source of income for those people. Well, that's going to be my next question. Is uh, My guess is that there is, and this is a guess, but um, a lot of the time when you hear about massive, you know, changes in uh, environment potentially or just even a a, a one-off, disaster right a tsunami comes through or something yeah. you know the hurricane comes through yeah. they point to a, yeah. an island or to a location and say it wipes out tourism and that is literally one of the primary sources of income for that region and it feels that's right it's interesting because i think we resonate with that and say well that's a massive problem you know we, we should be mindful of that and not really thinking about the impact that happens every single day through the nature in which yeah. we travel and book to go and see these places anyway and i think is it i mean the nature of a centralized kind of booking platform in anything, e-commerce, in finance or whatever, is that ultimately your platform operator, you're, you know, you're taking a monopolistic stance, right? You're trying to extract value from that. And that's essentially yeah. what we're seeing here in a lot of respects. But the net impact of that directly is that there are people on the ground who are not getting anywhere near the level of margin that they would be otherwise getting. I mean, what is a typical travel operator who might run that hotel or, you know, run a, a tour in that city are they, they're probably operating on 30, 35% margin anyway, right? So yeah, yeah, 25, absolutely. a 35 is losing 70 or 80% of their margin. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, again, it's, it's different everywhere, I guess, but it's, it's a ballpark, I guess. I really would love to learn in, in that specific community what their margins are, yeah. 
But you know what? I'm going to give you this thought. I was just watching the video on YouTube a couple of days ago about how in Sierra Leone, the diamond mines, which is like, it's a big production of diamond mines. Yep. They, that, I, can't, I don't know the numbers, right? But those mines are not owned by, by local companies right. and locals don't, do not benefit necessarily from that natural resource that they have there. Is that ethical? And of course, it's the legacy of the colonials time, right? So sure. is that ethical to sort of deprive these people of the riches that they have right there in the ground? And, and again, the, all the benefits of all, all the money that those mines produce go somewhere else, go to a Western country. Yeah. And then we complain that, hey, those guys, there should be more sustainable. Look at them throwing plastic on the ground and stuff like that. I mean, what are you talking about? So I would say that's unethical. I would say that is not sustainable. I would say that's hypocritical, sure. right? So, but, but this other community, right, that, that I'm talking about in Georgia, okay, it's not 100% sort of owned by, by some sort of power somewhere else, but it's 20%, maybe 30%, right, right, of the income of these people is taken away, is extracted from this community, mm. And is being sent to a legal entity somewhere in Ireland, so where they pay you one percent taxes or something like that, as as, as little as possible. Uh -huh. well, of course, we all know yeah. what all those big companies are doing. And is that ethical? Is that sustainable? I think that's absolutely nuts. And and you really, I, I really, yeah, finish. Uh, which is good. Which is why we're trying to get to the number. And I think there's, there's part of this that's kind of interesting to me as well is. Uh, I guess unpacking that kind of that model and understanding, okay, there's this huge amount of extraction of value that's happening. I'm interested in the value that is being added. I think in a world, I think about real estate as a, as a good example, right? In in the old days in real estate, no one knew where all the properties were, right? You had to ring in the US at least. You had to ring up an agent and say, "Can you put me in your car and drive me around and show me where all the properties are?" That's the only way you could know what was for sale, right? You had to talk to an agent. He had access that's to services, yep. and so. When things moved online, discovery was no longer the value add, no longer the domain of a real estate agent, but the actual act of helping you, you know, was the, was the domain and the purvey of the real estate agent. And they still serve a valuable function in that and their business models evolved to not discovery, but transaction and concierge. I'm interested in terms of, of travel, like is the primary function for platforms, the act of discovery and the act of, you know, actual payment and terms, I mean, like beyond those types of kind of utilitarian functions, is there some other service that is being provided or is it that's kind of really the nub of it? That's what people really want out of a travel booking environment. So, so look, of course, of course you're right. And we have to give credit where credit is due, right? Like these companies that, that we're talking about, they created this markets, right? Like the, in terms of online bookings and yeah. the ease of, uh, like they helped the travel economy to grow substantially. Sure. Absolutely. But again, kudos to them. They they did a tremendous amount of work mm -hmm. and, and did all of that. But what we also have to look at the the result of where we are right now, right? right? And you know, I'm not trying to say that that they're necessarily, you know, there's like some sort of evil agenda. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> whatever agenda there. Exactly, right? Like that's how that's how those things evolve. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, but the results are are not impressive. But what we're trying to say, you know, at Winding Tree, hey, before this technology appeared on the scene, blockchain, we didn't have any other choice. You know, if you wanted to have the, the comfort of sort of comparing multiple different hotels in one place and, and looking for different options and, and clicking on one and booking it, you didn't have any other choice. You, you, we, we literally, we didn't have any other way, any other technology of putting those those things together it, again at the end of the day what is it it's some sort of computer let's say in amsterdam somewhere where booking.com started right yeah. and uh, on that computer there is a list of possible hotel options for you if you want to go somewhere yeah. right then of course we have this network network of computers and you can access this database to to file whatever you're looking for mm -hmm. But now we have this completely new technology that says, it, again, necessarily this particular setup where this server, this database, it has to be hosted. It has to be controlled right. by a, a single company. Right. right. 
there was no yeah. other way. Now we're saying, hey, we have this new technology where you can host a database on multiple different computers so that there's no single owner, no single gatekeeper who is able at the end of the day when they acquire a critical mass to simply extract rent, to simply charge you, not because of the, you know, the value that you're receiving, simply because they can. Right. right? And that technology is, of course, blockchain. And again, what is blockchain? It's it's a type of a distributed database. Mm-hmm. It's not. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that, but not a lot more. I, I guess that was kind of what I was trying to get to. Is that if in in the case of the real estate example, people want to go and look at houses, and they're comfortable with this large decision. But if I think about any right. travel decision that I've made in the last twenty years, and I'm relatively self directed, but I'm going to use this sample size of one to kind of make sweeping generalization, which I'm happy for people to disagree with, at least 90% of the travel requirements I've had to make, probably 95%, but 90% being conservative, I've been able to make those decisions simply by utilizing the information available to me online. And it feels to me that if the discovery and the decision-making and the transacting, i.e. the booking and the paying, can all be made in a self-directed fashion, then the role of the platform, the centralized platform in trying to make that happen seems to be at risk if someone says we've got a version that can do this a two percent cost as opposed to an 18 or 20 percent cost and that it feels like that moment for that idea must have come and blockchain kind of enables that because it's decentralized and i think my secondary sort of follow-on question from it is is there some level of trust that requires the centralization when the photos aren't right and they're not actually what it looks like how do you how are you dealing with these issues that the platforms in theory are kind of there to, to gatekeeper. Like, you know, talk me through both of those parts of the equation. What is the main right now? All, all this craziness, of course, is going around Twitter and Elon Musk and stuff like that. And and people are discussing like, hey, what is the value of those the this, this social networks? Like, this company is running the social networks and right. stuff like that. One of the answers is actually, you know, that people are converging onto is it's it's moderation, right? right? It's trust. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you should be able to say, OK, so this is Donald Trump who's saying a certain thing. This is, you know, some other person who's saying s- something. And it is discovery, as you said. But but again, you, you know, I feel like going on Booking.com, you are very much self-directed. Like you have your you, ha- you have agency there. You have the mm-hmm. choice. Right. What they give to you, those centralized companies right now is trust. They have a database of hotels that, like, you should be, that they're certain, they're, they're telling you, hey, these are real hotels. By clicking on this hotel, by, by it's a, you know, clicking book. And we guarantee that, by the way, if it's a, you know, I don't I don't know if it happens on, on booking or how much. Uh, I, I certainly know that it happens on B- Airbnb all the time. You know, there are some fraudulent uh, right. advertisements and stuff like that. Right. There's a certain percentage, which is may or not, maybe around 1% or something mm-hmm. like that. Or that. I don't know. Hopefully lower. No one would. And so, but you're absolutely right that the, the, on the internet, no one knows that, that you're a dog, right? <laughs> I, love that, I love that reference. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, but so you, you absolutely have to provide that in, in a decentralized way. How do you, how do you do that? Right. So if the internet is completely sort of decentralized environment and you know we say in our space that blockchain is sort of the new version of the internet yeah. in, in, in exactly the same way as internet was decentralized back in the day uh-huh. right uh-huh. like i don't know you put up a website like how do i know who you are or how do i know that you are who you saying you are there is no way uh-huh. uh, i mean you can put up a, any website uh-huh. up, up until now and and there's no trust but in a decentralized way, there are ways to to solve this problem, to provide a level of trust in a completely decentralized way, which is absolutely fascinating. So the, the blockchain space, why it's so fascinating for me, because it's not just a technological innovation, but really people are creating all sorts of game theoretical constructs where in a completely decentralized way, without an intermediary, the network sort of arrives at the truth mm-hmm. automatically. Right. Right. So, so there are multiple projects. There's projects called Kleros, which my friends are, are working that, which is decentralized justice. Right. right. 
And they use all of this. Uh, there's a huge body of research. Is there, there is this thing that's called shelling point, which is basically the truth that people who are participating in this network will arrive at independently of each other, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely fascinating. It's, and we can do it. Yeah, I guess, and that kind of kind of be my follow on from this. So the kind of the acknowledgement here is that the basic utilitarian aspects of booking travel, discovery, you know, reviews even and pricing and, and booking can all be, you know, ethered out. They can all be sent to the blockchain very, very easily. And what you're left yeah. with is trust. And it's interesting that you mentioned Airbnb because there's actually a great talk, I think, with one of the founders, I think maybe Joe Gibby, I'm not entirely sure, where he talks about all they had to do to engineer trust into the platform. And it was a whole bunch of things. It wasn't one individual thing that suddenly said, wow, everyone's trusting us now, down to everything, quality of the photos through to, you know, the, the yeah. veracity of the identity of the person by linking to other known social profiles and presumably some algorithms around that. There's a suggestion here that, it, the technology and specifically Winding Tree itself is starting to work out how to solve this trust in decentralized networks and using travel as the context. Is that kind of where you guys are kind of finding yourself? So, you know, so, okay, so we didn't even say what Winding Tree is, right? No, like, that's not it. <laughs> yeah, people are like, what is, what are they talking about? But, so, anyway, you, you know, okay, so 2014, I was saying that I was starting to work at for real at, at this travel. Uh-huh problem and and again we we arrived at this idea that hey a lot of problems in the trial space are stemmed from the fact that trial industry is heavily centralized there are only a few companies uh-huh. and at the same time being a software engineer of course watching all of those the bitcoin craziness and ethereum and all of those things which are again fundamentally bitcoin and ethereum and blockchain is a tool for decentralization uh-huh. right the people say, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is means that you are your own bank, yep. right? Blockchain is really this technology that for the first time in our digital lives allows you to own your assets, whatever the, a, those assets are, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's your personal information, whether it's some sort of digital currency, but you really own and control it. Because, you know, in all other aspects right now, you know, you have, Gmail probably or something mm-hmm. like that. That's your email or it, any other email provider, right? You have your bank account. You have all of those things that you do digitally. You do not own and control yeah. that data, yeah. you know? And and there are two aspects there. One is that if you don't own and control it, some other people control it and therefore they can look it. Therefore, uh, uh, you know, maybe that data can be leaked, whether mm-hmm. by uh, a malicious employee or someone will hack that system, right? And second is they can run away with that data, perhaps. Uh, and if that data is money, if, and it happens all the time, you know, I work with people from Argentina, from, from Middle East, and each and every one of them has a similar story, you know. In Argentina, it's like inflation is like a thousand percent, you know, this year or some crazy amount. I, like I was there. It is that bad. So, second point relating to presumably the control of the data, such that the economic model under which that data and that service is provided can change, and you're kind of at the behest of the provider. Is that the sort of the second thrust of that? Yeah. So, so a lot of people talk about deplatforming problem right. with right. Airbnb specifically. Both suppliers in travelers, right? Mm-hmm. They, you know, I've read multiple articles where suppliers got deplatformed. They don't even know why, right. because Airbnb and their wisdom put in terms and conditions on their website a clause which says we don't have to explain anything. Right. Goodbye. Right. And uh, the same could happen with booking, I guess, with mm-hmm. Priceline, with, with any other company, with a bank. You know, again, the one, one problem working with, a, with this lady from Middle East, yeah, their bank got, I, I don't know what happened, but they lost all their life savings. Mm-hmm. You know? And, or what you can have, as, as I did, as uh, originally I'm from Russia, yeah, if, you, if you must know, but... With a few banks here in the European Union, I had this problem that they said, ah, actually, could you please send us, you know, your documents again for verification? And But, but in the meantime, we just going to freeze your account for about a month or maybe a couple months, right? right? <laughs> Nothing you can do about it right. because you do not control, your you asset. do not control your assets. Mm-hmm. 
You do not. With Bitcoin, with Ethereum, nothing like that could happen. There is no, you know, central authority that that would would do that to you. But of course, and you have a question there. Here. Yeah, I just I, the thing I kind of wanted to do with uh, I, I mean I'm taking it as read that there's some general understanding of kind of blockchain and Bitcoin for people listening, but I kind of I want to try to reimagine this or, or move this into the context specifically of travel and understanding. Is the imagination here that someone who is, you, I mean, you've got a marketplace, right? You've got people booking, you've got people who are providing travel services, doesn't matter, flights, hotels, tours, just whatever it is. And these are parties to a transaction in a kind of an e-commerce marketplace type model. Is the imagination here that both of those parties ultimately in a decentralized environment will control their version of themselves in that, you know, in, on that blockchain? That that my profile as a traveler with all the places that I've gone and the reviews that I've got and my identity potentially or some form of my identity that's attached to you know to that address for want of a better word lives within that that blockchain and then on, on the other side of that there is a an a, that hotel in georgia the country that yep. says that they here is our listing we've gone on and we've created a wallet and we've batted everything in our listing and, and it can't be it can be verified in in on the blockchain but it can also be verified against other sources in in real life presumably instead of building that trust exactly but ultimately they yeah. can control these are the photos and this is the thing is that essentially what at the core of what winding trees the reason why i'm asking this is because when i go and look at winding trees a couple of things that are interesting to me one is you guys have been around for, for a few years you talked about 2014 yeah. 2016 but there's also seems to yeah. be a range of kind of things that plug together and i'm trying to understand the pieces of the puzzle that Winding Tree is trying to solve and why isn't it just one big thing or what do those pieces represent? At the core is this idea that you should be able to, to again, right now, 10, 20 years ago, we didn't have the tech. Sure. We had to go through a centralized sort of choke point, mm -hmm. right, in order to, to get the comfort of, again, having all the hotels in one place. Today, with the distributed technology such as blockchain, we don't have to go through a central choke point, again, through an intermediary that could impose or all sorts of crazy things upon you. You don't have to. And therefore, we get rid of all those negative things, uh, such as, again, high commission fees and, and control from those companies. They can deplatform you, for example, or they can do crazy things, you know. I guess maybe some other time I could talk about <laughs> crazy things that those companies are doing, right? Yep. You don't have to do that ananymore. We can transact truly in a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized way, uh -huh. right? What it means, you still get the comfort of having everything in one place, right? Because it's, again, what blockchain is essentially a database, uh -huh. right? So you, all, you still uh, get all that information, but then you can transact directly with the supplier as, let's say, mm -hmm. a buyer yep. or something, yep. right? But we have so many things going on beyond that, right? Like, that's just the basis. The implications of the fact that both supplier and buyer truly control their digital assets, their identities, goes beyond that. Because, again, I'm going to give you one example is is reviews mm -hmm. huge huge problem in the trial space right you know we talked to i talked to my friends who are hoteliers a crazy problem which it, reviews that you that you read online how can you trust them how can anyone trust them <laughs> because guess what those reviews are controlled by central companies as well right right, right. and and TripAdvisor rumors are i mean as a supplier you get a negative review you go to TripAdvisor and you say um guys can you just you know delete that yeah and and guess what trip trip advisor is also incentivized because if you get a bad review and trip advisor has their own booking sort of interface right well, they get less money right. so they are interested in i guess most hotels to have positive reviews so people go and book and and again talking to my hotel hotel your friends and they're saying it's a crazy problem you know how we know that the hotel next door, that they pay for positive reviews giving on their, I don't know, Google Maps and TripAdvisors. And stuff. Right. But if we have, if we control our identities, both supplier and traveler, and if that information is verified on the blockchain, then we can get truly reviews that are completely 100% genuine, mm -hmm. right? 
Because if you don't go and you, if you don't transact with that specific hotel, guess what? You cannot leave a review. You've right. never been there. Right. There is no proof of that. Right. I, right. I think I feel so, like the parallel yeah. here is, you know, people take, you know, 30 years ago, I remember 30 years, God, how old am I? A little <laughs> bit more than 30 years ago. <laughs> I remember getting a CD, right? It was an Encarta, which was kind of the CD version of Encyclopedia Britannica and thinking, this is amazing. Like, I don't have to buy all those books anymore. Uh And then seven years later, Wikipedia came out and everyone said, well, how could it possibly be up to date? Anyone can change it. And the dynamic, I think, is interesting that says there are definitely sources of truth that are more accurate than Wikipedia. But on mass, Wikipedia has enabled far more accuracy and in, of, of information, like factual information, to exist in the world because it has been able to be verified by multiple parties. And just kind of the next step in that where you, you sort of take that, because everything's publicly on a bo- blockchain, you can run an algorithm over it and you can look for things that look like bad actors or whatever that is, and that the protocols themselves can actually respond to this problem. Is that part of what's happening here? You, you read that statistically, even using some heuristics, you can just determine, you know, which reviews are genuine or, or not. I think even with centralized systems. Right. But again, the companies that run those those things, they're not quite interested in doing that. Sure. Right. Sure. But with blockchain, we prevent we or, or we could potentially prevent this. This particular part is not functional. It's just a theory. Uh, uh, well, we know it's possible. We know we can do it. We know we can achieve. I'm going to say 100 percent reviews that you can trust because they were made truly by people who went and went stayed there. at those hotels. Yep. Yeah. I mean, very expensive be, to leave a bad review just for the sake of leaving it. You have to. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Even if and, you and, uh, it. Precisely, and and maybe we could we could put some additional controls in there, maybe some. But uh, you know, I'm starting to mumble and and imagine things. Well, but, I, I kind of uh, I do uh, want to go down this rabbit hole because I think people tend to think of a blockchain as a fairly static thing, but ultimately it's public code that can be improved, and people can agree to the improvement, right? So, if you take the blockchain as you have, let's say you've got a decentralized blockchain built on ethereum so it's got some smart contracts in it that's writing running winding tree today or running this part of winding tree and the community whether that's people who you're funding or people who are just choosing to do so say we found a better way to run an algorithm that actually takes our 90 percent review accuracy and flags it up to 97 percent and we've back tested it on the 14 million reviews that are on there now however many reviews are on there at the time where someone does it then in theory the people who own that blockchain in whatever way, whatever through over the consensus can say, well, let's move to that new protocol that's baked in on, or just lay it on top of the on top of the, the fundamental network. Is that kind of the the nature of how Winding Tree is set up? Which is, look, we want this thing to exist. We're seeding it, if you like. We're putting it into the universe. We've built an economic model in there that allows us to continue to fund its development and its growth. But ultimately, the thing will become self serving. Is that kind of the pathway here, the trajectory? Absolutely, absolutely. So, so it, like you are. And I see that you, you've you read the things about blockchain and stuff, but you're absolutely right. So, so in one of my presentations, in, which I'm doing quite a bit these days, yeah, we want to create a system which is, I, you know, imagine there is a monarchy where it's really a single person is in control sure. and, and a democracy where we all get together and everyone gets to cast a vote and decide what kind of world they want to live in, uh, right? Uh-huh. Uh, and, and, and again, on so many different levels right now, the things that you have on your phone, the, the books in your Kindle, right, you know? Right. Like, we, we're all in the hands of these dictators, and, and hopefully in some cases they are benevolent, but <laughs> in so many cases, you remember that case, how Amazon deleted the book from pe- people bought the book yeah uh, and it was in their de- on their devices and the book was subsequently deleted yeah. from from their devices and out of all the books it was 1984 yeah. if you remember that these good uses of already that is everyone yes and so but in the in a decentralized world, again, it's not possible. And so again, the the line from my pitch is we want to create a platform where 
It's the users of the platform, the suppliers, all the stakeholders of the platform benefit from it Uh, and not just one single company that gets to run the code. Right. Uh, The thing that I kind of want to understand from here, because you you made this point a couple of times just in our conversation today, that the technology just didn't exist. I would argue that to a degree now the technology does exist. The technology will continue to evolve as technology does, but it does exist to the point now where technically you could create this decentralized marketplace. In terms of where winding trees up to and probably the market generally, but really specifically with you guys, like where are you up to with it and like what what's the barrier to, to adoption and getting over that kind of trough of despair or whatever they call it in the adoption curve? Yeah, yeah. You know, what we're up to, the single most important thing that we can do is education. Mm -hmm. Because people simply don't understand what it is. Right. You know, and and, and again, all the journalists that keep writing about the Bitcoin prices and and all all the crazy stuff, all the hacks. I, I mean, sure, we get to cover that. But that's not, it's not what this technology is about. Right. We so people simply don't ask, again. We go and talk to to hotels and to airlines and to all, all the other stakeholders from the travel industry about it. Uh-huh. People simply don't get it, uh-huh. and it gets to the point. You know, I was a few months ago. I was talking to to a person, to a chief editor of one of the biggest travel outlets. You know, travel websites uh-huh. that, that that covers travel technology and distribution and whatnot. And you know, I've been talking to that person for years. Right. <laughs> And at the end of the of our conversation, it sort of dawned on me to ask, and I'm, I'm explaining all these things. I'm explaining that, hey, this is like you get to own your assets and stuff. And and I'm asking them, do you own a wallet? Do you, do you, you know, do you own any cryptocurrency, any assets? No, they haven't even made the first, the, the simplest sort of step of creating a crypto wallet. And But even that simple step, you learn so much by doing that, yeah. but they didn't. And and uh, to, again, I don't know what the barrier in their head uh, in that particular person, I guess, is. But I, I think in general, across the board, I think the barrier is is this. On one hand, it is this image that was created in the media about cryptocurrencies that, of course, are are rooted in this technology yeah. that's called blockchain. Yeah. And, and of course, there is a lot of scam. Of course, there is a lot of, you know, all, all, all sorts of bad actors are there. Yeah. But it doesn't change the, the fundamental nature of this technology. It's the single technology probably that, that we have today that, again, that empowers individuals. Uh-huh. Right. And, and I sort of, uh, I, I juxtapose it to, to AI which AI is a technology that empowers huge corporations because in order to apply artificial intelligence and machine learning, you have to have huge amounts of data. You have to have a huge data set. So only big companies will benefit from AI. Right. On the exact opposite side of the spectrum is blockchain, which is a technology, which is a technology that empowers individuals. Uh-huh. You, as an individual, using that technology can control uh-huh. your assets. And so... The, again, the single most important thing that we can do today as Winding Tree is to go and educate. Yes, we created the technology. The technology is there. I, I mean, of course, it will keep evolving and we, we will keep adding new things to it, such as, you know, trusted reviews and stuff like that. But the the barrier that we have right now is we go and talk to to all sorts of stakeholders in the trial space and and they don't get it. And we have to explain it from the very beginning. And, and, and of course, people don't have the patience to, to sort of sit, sit and listen and learn. And, and, and it's a huge, huge barrier. Yeah, I was, I was kind of, I wanted to, I guess there's, a, there's kind of a, a, an adoption curve that happens when the motivation and the opposing force of the friction, one outweighs the other, right? And it's just very basic kind of models of behavior. And if I think back to your example of the hotel in Georgia, They've, they've clearly got a impediment on how they're doing things today and a new platform would represent, at a, with a different cost structure, would represent a massive motivation. They would be Their first question would be, who goes to that place? So how many people am I going to get from booking from that? I'm not sure of the answer to that, but ignoring that for one second. The friction that would be applied to them to be able to participate in, you know, Winding Tree in this example, is that a big part of the what you're having to solve i mean education and awareness of this thing exists you can be part of it is one thing 
But if it's three clicks versus you have to learn how to install MetaMask and do a bunch of other things that, you know, that people might, you know, have trouble remembering their PIN number, right? So um, I'm trying to understand is, is part of this a product design and behavioral change thing as much as it is a technology thing and an education thing? It, it's, a, it's a huge, huge problem. You're absolutely right. Mm. And uh, that's sort of where most of the time where, where we fail, you know, again, we're a hotel what, we go to a conference where all those hoteliers and airlines, right. they they say it all the time. Oh, you know, we're suffering so much from all this intermediaries. The commission fees are crazy, like right. blah, 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 all of those <laughs> things. You know, we, we wish someone could help us. We're like, hey, check this out. We've got, we've got the things over here. Uh. And they're like, oh, no, this is too alien. This is too new. Why is this so new? Why do I have to learn all of these things? Why does it, why doesn't it look like the old thing? And, and at this point, I mean, we have nothing else to say, but like to choose your poison. Yeah, you, can, yeah. you can either can continue doing the old thing right. or, or learn, learn some new tricks, which it, again, it's another problem that, that we have to have a critical mass of, of suppliers and buyers on right. our platform, which we're constantly working. Yeah, I mean, so what, what we've been su- su- successful so far, I mean, we, we know how to do this. Right. We created this technology right, right now. We have to seed it see them see the marketplace and and it's a process it, it, again there are multiple barriers but we're hoping that in in the travel uh sorry in the crypto industry there's a lot of innovation yeah. and crypto people they understand and talking to all of stakeholders people from all those different blockchains that are popping up that are energy efficient yes people will solve that problem mm-hmm. You know all these blockchains that are energy efficient. What is their problem? Number one is is usage, right? right? They want people to come to to those platforms, yep. but go and approach a person on the street and uh, say, "Hey, you can do all these cool things, but you have to learn how to use MetaMask." And and of course, it's a no. It's a blank stare. You know, yeah, it's a bridge too far. But right now, yeah, that right now there are all these new wallets that are, that are being created. Like they get new technology, new sort of games that you can play where maybe you don't have to remember your seed phrase. Right. You don't have to back it up. You know, it's called social recovery wallets. Mm-hmm. There are all of these different approaches that we can employ here yeah. to to solve this problem. But, you know, what I'm thinking and, you know, from my conversations with a lot of people across at, at this point, you know, five, six, six years one of the things that I see, it really, this is a technology that empowers you as an individual. Mm-hmm. But beyond just learning this new tech, which is not complicated, I mean, it really isn't. I think there is like a psychological barrier where the Web 2 paradigm that we all exist in today, mm-hmm. right? It, it has like psychologically, you know, there's always this more powerful someone right. who can help you. Right. Whenever something goes wrong, right. there's I'm I'm I, I'm even gonna say like a parent figure, yeah, right? I was like say a daddy, but sure, your father, <laughs> your daddy, exactly. Like, hey, daddy, you know, I lost my password. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. Okay, here you go. Here's <laughs> we're gonna change your password. But if daddy is a, is an alcoholic and he runs away <laughs> with all the money, and you know, like, and I'm sorry, you might you deal you with know. the devil. <laughs> You have to deal with that. And again, it happens all the time. Yeah. The, the all, all those daddies in the banks in, in Lebanon, you know, they're gone. Yeah. And with the money. So that's it. But again, here you have to grow even like on a psychological level where you have to take on more responsibility because again, it's, it's, I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with how blockchains operate, but if you lose your password from your crypto wallet, that's it. Yeah. Well, you there's are, no recovery no, from there's no one else. There is no recovery from that, yeah, right? And, and of course, all the news, uh, all, all the news that you read about that a person lost all their Bitcoin to whatever it is, right? Like that's exactly that. They lost their password and therefore they, they are not able to recover anything. Yeah. But so, so see that here you have to take on more responsibility. You have to really be very careful about that password. Yeah. You have to store it in a safe and secure place. So, one, you don't lose it, and two, no one else accidentally gets access to it, which, of course, is is going to be fatal for you because all your money is going to be gone. Yeah, I, th- I think um, I, I've got just a couple more questions, and they one of them relates to kind of a rising tide lifting all boats here. And so you imagine, fast forward five years, 
and there's 500 million people who have some form of wallet on one of the major exchange, uh, not on one of the major blockchains, but Bitcoin or Ethereum or Solana, or, you know, these kind of uh-huh. major chains. Yeah. Presumably, because of the way those blockchains work, they essentially are automatically or essentially able to very easily become participants in Winding Tree because they're already there. They're already present. They already have a wallet. They literally just bring that identity and attach that identity. So part of this is not about how do you drive Winding Tree adoption, but how do you ensure that Winding Tree is interoperable with the places where people are ultimately going to get wallets as a source of their wealth or funds or even identity to a degree. My first question. And then the second one is more around kind of whether Winding Tree and travel industry as a use case is kind of the canary in the coal mine. Because if we think about what's happening here is that it, what, if, if you can solve the trust problem of distributed or decentralized kind of commerce, which travel being the example you're looking at, it then starts to say, well, what else could you decentralize? Is that kind of how you guys are thinking about travel? That's exactly right. I mean, if this can be applied to the travel industry, and, and travel industry is, is interesting it's unique in the sense that the product is completely virtual, right? right? What What is being sold is just an agreement for you to go and stay at a certain hotel or Get on know, a flight. take a flight. And, and a certain, exactly. Right. So, so there is no overhead in terms of connecting that, that virtual thing that lives on the blockchain to an actual asset that, that perhaps moves on the ground and ha- if you have to, I don't know, to do all sorts of controls around right. it. But, but that, yeah, we can apply it to so many other things. If, if we can, as you said, solve, solve the trust problem here. But th- that's exactly clear hope that it, travel is the first first industry here. Yeah. We, we try and solve it. And maybe it is the wrong industry to do that because the industry is very much stuck, you know, in this net of co-dependencies on this legacy providers. And, you know, there, there are all sorts of different forces that are in play here. Which on one hand is interesting, or not another hand is quite frustrating. <laughs> but we're having fun, and that's that's the most important thing, you know. Like I, I, <laughs> the, re- the reason I kind of the reason I was interested in it in the, the parallel to say finance, right, is you know if if you put your wealth into the blockchain, for example, and it goes, it's a major problem, right? If you book a flight via some kind of decentralized network, and there's a problem with the flight, yeah, you're going to leave a shitty review somewhere. You know, you're going to get upset and tell your friends about it at a dinner party. Your life might fundamentally change, but it probably isn't going to fundamentally change. So the impact of the person yeah. or even the travel booker of the thing not working beautifully every single time is much, much lower than the use case of this is your money, this is your wealth. And I wonder whether decentralized right. used cases have started up a bit high and actually need to start at these lower risk use cases and get the thing that get the bugs ironed out in how these things work and even build networks of trust that then you can build and lay a higher value and higher risk transactions on top of this is a beautiful thought but i feel like we're going the like crypto industry right now in the exactly opposite configuration where people are staking their you know their houses and their their everything onto some some shit coin and they're hoping to you know to 10x uh, that amount to within two weeks or something like that, then of course they lose their money and really? the, they, they lose their life savings. And, you know, and of course all the bad stigma that, that we hear about come, stems from that. Yeah, I wish we started with, with this low risk uh, situations like travel. Yeah, you just live a shitty review and you move on, but you, you don't sacrifice yeah, you know, you're not, you're not your life your savings. Your entire existence on the planet. It's just, it's just that we, yeah. you know, as a, I don't know, we've we've kind of conflated blockchain with currency and store of value, as opposed to blockchain as a representation of commitment and transaction and contract. And I think your point before that a blockchain is really just a distributed database or ledger that identifies that one person is one person and one player is another player, and they've agreed to do this thing, and now the rest of that plays out in the real world is kind of what's been lost. And I think in the last couple of years, we've seen a massive kind of spike in interest in NFTs. And all we've done is gone back to the same problem of saying, these are really good for these high value, expensive, rareables things. And we have to create artificial scarcity. And we're like, can we just, can we just take a log off the fire and just focus on the use case that says there's a bunch of participants and they already transact. And the mechanism by which they transact is centralized. 
And that has some advantages, but in a world where it could be decentralized, the economic benefit flows to both sides if you can decentralize it. So let's find the lowest risk and the lowest effort and the lowest kind of anxiety transactions that could be decentralized and travel feels like one of those. And let's start with those and get that right and get people used to this idea and then build on top of that. You're absolutely right. You know, so I'm talking again, I'm talking to people from all these blockchains and the, the problem is that, that they have again, and they want more users to, to come to their platforms. Okay. But again, you approach a person on the street and why would they do that? Right. Why would a person today create a wallet? It's for speculation, I know. for basically trading in art, which is like none of those two things most people are interested in. Right. It's just like, why would I do that? Why would I enter the crypto space? So to crypto users, what we're offering is a use case of the world to new crypto users, to not to users who are who are about to be crypto users, right? <laughs> we're offering a very, very concrete use case. Like, hey, why would you create a crypto wallet? Guess what? To get 20% off your next hotel no, booking, no, right? No. Or or your flight. And that and that's it. Yes. Uh but, and by the way, I think we we should do another podcast episode about NFTs. So we could totally because it just opened up Pandora box. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's some good parallels there. I think what for all of along the interviews for our first ever blockchain interview. Um so we'll leave it there for today. But super fascinating. There was a lot of rabbit holes in that. And uh, look, you talked before about having presentations that you're working on. I'd love for you to send us some of the links to some of the stuff that you're writing about or talking about so that we can share some of that with people who are watching or listening to the show. So if you could do that as well, that'd be great. But Max, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was really fascinating talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anson. Thank you for having me. Thanks. It was a great conversation. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Shape the System. As usual, if you'd like to suggest a guest, someone that you know who's helped to change a system for the better, please go to www.shapethesystem.org, click on the top right-hand corner, then click Suggest Guest. Make sure that you click Subscribe so that you get the new episode. Shape the System is an independent podcast with support from KPMG High Growth Ventures. Connect founders to the services they need along their journey. Whether you are looking to refine your strategy, mature your finance function, prepare for a capital raise, expand abroad, or simply comply with regulatory requirements, they provide you with the support you need to drive your business forward.